you know, again, I guess to ask, you know, you brought up Bolton, you brought up Pompeo, you brought up Trump. What is it right now? Why right now? Like, I, I, I figure that, you know, I'm sure there's as good a time as any to to instigate a coup. But it's interesting that this is the moment they chose are, are choosing to do it. Is it the is it the people that's in the Trump administration that have a particular pen, uh, pension for uh, uh, you know war and and uh, you know coups and and you know all of that like with Bolton or Pompeo and Trump or is it some other external or some bigger factor that isn't being uh, addressed that regardless of who's in power in the United States uh, that this would be happening right now anyway? Do you understand what I'm kind of uh, laying out? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's it's. It's a combination of many different factors. I think that something like this is 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 never, you know, just cut and dried. I mean, we really have to look at it from from a number of different angles. Yes, of course, uh, the oil is a major part of all of this. I mean, this is this is the moment that the United States has kind of moved into the role of oil exporter. Right. So now now the United States, which has traditionally been this, uh, you know, this this oil sucking uh, oil importing, you know, juggernaut has turned into one of the world's leading oil exporters, right? So now consolidation over control of Venezuela's oil is not simply about generating profits. It's also about controlling a major sector of the market. It's about controlling one of the primary sources of oil that's going on to the global market outside of the Middle East, right? So so there is this, this obvious oil connection here. And of course, there's, there's more to it even than that, because it's not just the reserves that are proven. It's also the a number of yet unproven, sometimes even unexplored areas where uh, the uh, groups like the U.S. Geological Survey have found that potentially are some of the biggest oil fields in the world, including in uh, the the region known as Essequibo, which is uh, offshore on the border area between Venezuela and Guyana. Um, and I don't want to go too far into that, in, into the weeds on that. But needless to say, that is a dispute between those two countries that goes back more than a hundred years. It's uh, it's again an, another remnant of uh, colonial policy and the way that borders were drawn and so forth. So uh, ExxonMobil has been pushing very hard to get into the Essequibo region. The Venezuelan government has been pushing very hard to keep them out. Uh, and ExxonMobil was propping up the government of Guyana, stoking this conflict, etc. So, um, and of course, let's not forget the CEO of ExxonMobil. Mobile is Rex Tillerson, or was Rex Tillerson previously, also most recently the uh, the uh, Secretary of State under Trump. So you have this kind of merger of the oil sector, the uh, you know big oil, with the U.S. government itself there is obviously this this uh you know this issue of you know let's call it what it is i mean stealing venezuela's oil essentially or at least controlling it right but there's more to it even than that because really what we're talking about is not so much oil but control over venezuela's oil and uh what the united states and this is what i argued in my piece that you mentioned and i as far as i know nobody else has really written about it is uh that the United States was deeply concerned about Russia in Venezuela, and that Venezuela is, in the minds of people like Pompeo and Bolton, really uh, another theater of a broader global conflict with the Russians. And um, this is, uh, well, just to lay it out very, very quickly, uh, the Russians were sanctioned by the United States in 2014, as I think everybody probably knows, when Russia annexed Crimea, uh, and then especially once Russia got involved in Ukraine's uh, civil war in the east. Uh, Russia went under sanctions. Some of the major uh, oligarchs went under sanctions and various other sectors of the economy, right? So what the Russians were looking for, they were desperately searching for a way of regaining leverage against the Americans. And there's a lot of different ways they can do that. The Russians are major weapons uh, manufacturers and weapons exporters. They have tremendous amount of influence with their energy exports in Europe, et, et cetera. But 
with regard to leveraging the United States, especially now that the United States is an oil producer, what they really wanted to do was find a way to get in uh, into Venezuela and to control, at least have some control over Venezuela's oil sector and use that as a bargaining chip with the United States. And that's exactly what they did. Venezuela, as we've already discussed at length, was in economic free fall by 2016 and were desperate for financing. And they couldn't get financing on the international market because the United States had frozen them out. The banks weren't going to lend to them, et cetera, right? And uh, the IMF is a non-starter and it hasn't been and has been for quite a long time in Venezuela since Chavez's time. So what the Venezuelan government was forced to do was to take a loan from the Russians. This was one and a half billion dollar loan, which is rather small if you if you think about it in the grand scheme of things. But it was enough to kind of keep the government afloat, to keep the oil going, uh, at least temporarily. And in exchange for that one and a half billion dollar loan, the Russians were given a 49.9% stake of Sitco. Sitco is the U.S. subsidiary of PDVSA, the, uh, the uh, Venezuelan uh, national oil company. So effectively, the Russians controlled almost half of Venezuela's uh, presence in the U.S. oil sector which, as you can imagine, is deeply uh, uh, you know, troubling to the strategic <laughs> planners in Washington, right? Because yeah. essentially, essentially now you're in a situation where if for some reason the fracking boom goes bust and the U.S. is again dependent upon Venezuelan oil, now the Russians can just turn off the spigots if they wanted to, right? Now, I mean, it's, it's obviously more complicated than that, but I mean, at a basic level. So what the U.S., what, what, what we saw, and this was a report from Reuters in early 2018, was that a consortium, very shadowy, totally totally unnamed, mysterious figures, but a consortium of what we would assume to be, you know, billionaires and various other powerful individuals got together and basically hatched a scheme to more or less buy that loan. In other words, to give the money, uh, one and a half billion dollars or whatever it would be to Venezuela to pay off that loan and transfer ownership of the of, of the debt. In other words, to force the Russians out of Venezuela. And this was going to be done by this private consortium. Why? Because the Trump administration wasn't prepared to go, you know, to the lengths that it needed to go to, at least in the minds of these people. Now, I just should just add here. Trump has talked about in military intervention into Venezuela going back at least to 2016, okay? And in an especially famous exchange that was reported by the Associated Press, he simply asked, you know, well, why can't we just invade them? And apparently, according to multiple people in the room, Rex Tillerson, again, ExxonMobil's CEO and State Department Secretary, Rex Tillerson, and National Security Advisor at the time, H.R. McMaster, were, quote, stunned by the stupidity of the statement, right? They couldn't believe that Trump would even suggest a military intervention into Venezuela because, you know, while these people may be, you know, you know, imperialist pigs, they're not dummies. I mean, they understand the kind of ramifications that would have both for the United States, but for all of Latin America, potentially global oil markets and who knows what else, right? So it, so, so it was a non-starter at the time. But since then, Tillerson is out, McMaster is out, and in their place, you, in, in their place, you have Pompeo and uh, Bolton. These are two of the most extreme nutcases that ever, you know, walked the face of the policy earth. You know, these are people, especially Bolton, who is, I mean, quite literally one of the most genocidal warmongers anywhere on the planet, right? This is somebody who advocates for war with Iran. This is somebody who advocates for essentially global, global scale conflicts. And this is the man who's, who's forming national security policy and has Trump's ear. So within 12 months of this consortium coming forward to try to find a, you know, call it a private sector solution, as they called it, to this problem. Here we go with these nutcases around Trump, and all of a sudden now we have a coup in Venezuela. So in other words, what you've seen is an escalation in not just the rhetoric, but an escalation in the, uh, you know, the, the, um, We'll call it the Overton window of imperialism here. What is acceptable to the U.S. policymakers? And at this point now, everything, including full-scale military invasion of Venezuela, is on the table.